Joey Mervis is a 2013 graduate of Sycamore School and a 2017 graduate of North Central High School. He works in New York City as a videographer, performer, producer, and playback engineer. He attended NYU's Steinhardt School where he studied vocal performance and minored in production and entertainment business. In 2020, Joey co-founded Riverbend Production Company, where he managed a team of editors to create more than 200 virtual performance videos for clients, including the Atlanta Opera and the DEA's Virtual Red Ribbon Week. Joey graduated in 2022 and returned to New York, where he now works as the director of video productions for Broadway World, an online outlet covering Broadway and off-Broadway news. He films and edits a variety of content, as well as producing live coverage from Broadway opening nights. Joey started performing professionally in Indianapolis while a student here at Sycamore. My earliest recollection of a performance uh, was a junior civic production of Charlotte's Web. Uh, Senora Hollander, anybody here remember Senora Hollander? And Mrs. Sandy and I were in the audience, and my, my recollection involves uh, Senora, as he exited into the main uh, lobby after the show, Senora Hollander immediately, followed by the two of us, handed him her program to sign because it was obvious that he was going to be a star. And we all knew that right away. We, we knew he was destined for greatness. Um, we followed his career, sometimes as a whole school, uh, going to see him at uh, IRT in, uh, uh, as you said, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and uh, the baseball player, 40, uh, 45. Jackie and me, yes, all right, That's, I couldn't think of it. Okay, and several of us followed his career um, through several performances throughout the Indianapolis area, I think the last thing I saw was a program with you at North Central High School. Was it uh, Catch Me If You Can? Okay, uh, and you did Oklahoma there as well. So, in, in fact, he was kind enough, because I was gonna be out of town for the performance, he was kind enough to let me come see a dress rehearsal, because I'm a huge fan, in case you <laughs> hadn't guessed that. Um, he has performed in New York at Carnegie Hall, the Green Room 42, and Off-Broadway at New World Stages. He has fundraised and produced events for nonprofits such as Summerstock Stage and the Caroline Sims Children's Cancer Endowment, where he served as Vice President of Media since 2017. Uh, Joey's older brother, Isaac, is a 2011 Sycamore grad, and his younger brother, Gabe, graduated in 2018. And just before I give this to uh, Joey, I think I'm not alone when I say that listening to you guys has made us all realize we've wasted a good part of our <laughs> of our lives here. I mean, it's just mind-boggling what these students have, former students have done. So without further ado, I introduce to you Joey Mervis. Thank you so much, Mrs. Prince. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Do we need a seventh inning stretch? We're almost home, I promise. Um, thank you so much, Mrs. Prince, for being here tonight for that amazing introduction. Um, those experiences of, of you three teachers and honestly, almost all of the teachers that are here tonight and even those that aren't coming to see me in shows and always supporting me, something I'll talk about a little later, but is, is really one of the highlights of Sycamore for me. So thank you all for that. All right. So, like Mrs. Prince said, my name is Joey Mervis, and uh, I started here at Sycamore in EC2, in, I believe, 2002. I want everyone to really uh, take in these cute pictures when I was really little, because I promise it only gets worse from here. <laughs> I stayed all the way through eighth grade here at Sycamore, and I loved my time here. Like Mrs. Prince said, I have three brothers, Isaac, Sam, and Gabe, and they all spend time here at Sycamore. I had to ask the kids earlier today if they still have the 500 Club in kindergarten. I, that was one of the coolest moments of my life, clearly. 
I was one of the first people to reach the 500 club. For the uninitiated, you have to write the numbers to 500. Am I explaining that correctly? Yeah. Great. Um, and I was the first one to get there, and I was clearly so excited about it. <laughs> that has nothing to do with this presentation, but I really wanted to share that. Um, I've always been someone who's been interested in a lot of things. And from a really early age, most of those things have revolved around some sort of performing and some kind of making videos. I love creating things with other people, telling stories, and I've always loved putting on a good show. One of my EC2 teachers would, told, would tell me years later that they remember me pushing blocks together in the corner of the classroom to make a stage and forcing my friends to be in shows that I would put on. My parents took me to see shows around Indianapolis and my grandparents, and once they signed me up for kids' classes at a community theater, I was pretty much hooked. About the same time, I also started borrowing, or honestly really just stealing, my parents' video camera and making home movies. I cannot remember what any of them were about, and thankfully I do not still have access to any of them to show you today, but I can tell you that no one in my house was safe from being roped in and getting involved. Not my parents, my siblings, any friend that happened to be over, or a babysitter that was watching us at the time. I was always curious. I had a lot more energy then than I do now, and I did not really like to take no for an answer. I remember begging for years before I was in middle school if I could be part of the drama club. Because I wasn't in middle school yet, I couldn't be in any shows, but Mrs. Yednak, who was in charge of the drama club, let me shadow the tech crew sometimes when I would come in. All of the middle schoolers already had jobs, so I decided that I should make up my own. I borrowed my parents' video cameras again, and I decided that I should film the show from two angles at the back of the auditorium, and then I could make DVDs for everyone. I had seen a videographer do this for some of the shows that I was in, so I figured I could just uh, figure it out by trying. When I finally could be in the drama club, I got to try everything. And of course, I wanted to be in the shows. See. I told you it gets worse. <laughs> but here you can try anything. So I tried things like designing the lights for Willy Wonka. I got Coach Licklider to let me assist her in directing Into the Woods Junior. And of course, because that was my eighth grade year, we had to pull out all the stops and add in some projection design, which I believe had not been used up until that point. I don't think you can even tell in these videos, but let me tell you, it was awesome. <laughs> We also went to Mr. Schuth and asked if he could help us make a little bit more magic in the show. So obviously, I thought these things were pretty cool at the time. And all of these ideas, crazy or simple, we got to bring them to life because we were supported by faculty who are not only so good at what they do, but they truly find joy in helping us achieve things we didn't think were possible. Now, it's a few years too late for me to get in trouble for this, so it's fine that I admit it now, but if I didn't have anything to do after school, most of the time I would just come into this auditorium when it was empty and play around. I would try to teach myself things at the tech table in the back, and I would play with equipment that I definitely did not have permission to touch. <laughs> the more I look back on it, the more grateful I am for the opportunities I had at Sycamore to learn to be curious about so many different things and to have the resources and the encouragement to explore them. And I don't just mean keeping the auditorium unlocked. But I do mean the group of teachers who would always come to see me in shows that I was in outside of school. And I do mean my classmates, who were always passionate about their own interests, but uh, were, who were always passionate about their own interests, but also willing to help each other out and play along. And we wanted to see each other excel in the things that made us happy. I also got encouragement to explore my passions outside of school when, as we already talked about, I got cast in the fourth grade as Dill, the next door neighbor in To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes, unfortunately, that is also me. Before I could accept the role, I had to get approval from the school and from each and every one of my teachers to be in and out of classes for rehearsals and performances for about two months. I wouldn't be excused from any of the work that I missed while I wasn't here, and I had to keep my grades up. And every single teacher said yes. They believed I was capable of taking on that challenge, and all of my teachers went the extra mile to work with me before or after school to make sure that I always stayed caught up. And then I tricked them into letting me do it two more times, the year after that, and the year after that. But jumping back to fourth grade for a second, 
The development department at the time somehow knew about my passion for making videos, and they asked me to come up with an idea and film a video for the auction to raise money for the school's first MacBook cart. We were walking around earlier before the speech and I now see that the MacBook carts are just like stationed every 10 feet through the hallway. But this was the first, I think, the first MacBook cart that we ever got. Or those like iPad chargers. I don't know, but I, rem I was here for the first one. Anyways, um, <laughs> jump, uh, when I was in sixth grade and my older brother Isaac was graduating, I went to Miss O'Malley and I asked for their eighth grade extravaganza, could I help make a video and film what they were doing and record interviews with teachers and then put together a DVD for everybody to take home after. And then years later, after Sycamore, when I was home on a summer break from college, Sycamore asked me to collaborate on another video, this time hiring me to make a new, help make a new admissions video for the school. Sorry to leave it on a bit of a cliffhanger, but it is on YouTube if you want to watch the whole thing. Now, obviously, I wanted to help in these situations because Sycamore has given so much to me and because I enjoy making these videos. But being asked to collaborate on each of these projects also made a big impact on me each time. I was validated in my passion and told that even from a young age, I had something to contribute. I was challenged to grow, and it showed me how I could use what I was interested in to accomplish something that would later become part of my career. Inside these walls, my dreams were always valid, whether they be an EC2 to put on shows in the corner of the classroom or starting my career in videography. It really felt like I could do anything that I put my mind to. Now, when you're the type of kid who goes to Sycamore, there's probably also a part of you that interprets that as, I should be doing everything all the time. So I graduated from Sycamore in 2013 and I headed over to North Central. I continued to perform and I also started to make commercials for the student news. Honestly, mainly just to get people interested and excited about the shows and different events that we were putting on. But I still tried to get in involved in pretty much any way that I could. It was the start of a long pattern of stretching myself too thin because it seemed like there were so many things that I wanted to accomplish and not enough time to do them all. I thought maybe one might load, but no. <laughs> I graduated from, uh, I made it out the other side in 2017, graduated from North Central, and then I went to NYU, which meant moving to New York City. I graduated from NYU uh, four years later in 2021, and during that time, nothing of note happened in the world, or <laughs> no, everything pretty much happened as it was supposed to. We'll get to that part later. But right now, I'm going to take you with me to New York City because these are two maps of Manhattan. It is an island that's only 20, this part was also mainly for the kids, but bear with me. It's an island that's only 23 square miles. The area of Indianapolis is 15 miles larger. And if you put Manhattan on the state of Indiana, it would look like this. But it's made up of lots of complicated neighborhoods and boroughs that I am still learning. And I started learning down in the East Village. Most of NYU's buildings are located here around Washington Square Park. My freshman year, I lived in a dorm, but ever since then, I've lived in an apartment just a few blocks away from campus. Uh, I studied vocal performance with minors in producing and entertainment business, and it gave me a chance to learn more about all of my different interests, like performing, videography, and business, and then see them in action all over the city. One of my favorite memories was having a scene study class on a Friday afternoon with a professor, and then a few hours later going to see West Side Story on Broadway and watching him conduct the orchestra, because teaching us was pretty much just his day job. After I graduated, on time, as we've discussed, I did some work in audio engineering, and I got to work on a national tour, I got to work on a Broadway show, and then I started working at my current job where I'm now director of video content for Broadway World. Broadway World is an online news site that's covered Broadway, off-Broadway, movies, and television for the last 20 years. 
Every day I film and edit different types of videos like these um, that include interviews, performances, and opening night red carpets. I've gotten to meet some of my heroes, and every day is something new. For example, last night we filmed interviews at the opening night of Camelot on Broadway, and I have to fly back on Sunday morning for the last performance of the Phantom of the Opera. So my usual routine involves me taking a bunch of equipment to a Broadway theater or to an interview somewhere up here in the theater district. And most of the time, I get there using one of the greatest and worst inventions of all time, <laughs> the subway. All right, this part of the presentation was really geared towards the students, and I had it all planned in my head that I would ask them to raise their hand, and I would say, who's been to New York before? And I thought a couple of them would raise their hand, and I'd say, who's been on the subway in New York before? And there'd be maybe like five or six hands. When I tell you that every hand in this auditorium was raised, that all of these kids have ridden the subway in New York City. So to the parents, I thank you for culturing your children, but you really screwed up my presentation. So. We're gonna pretend. Bear with me. The subway is a magical place that can get you anywhere in the city, almost, and it is way faster than a car some of the time. As long as you don't run into any delays, track rerouting, power failures, signal problems, maintenance, etc. Plus, you get to see all kinds of cool things down in the subway. You get to see musicians, artists, dancers, mariachi bands, DJs, and the rest are redacted because I was speaking to children. <laughs> but it's unavoidable that when you ride the subway, it's not always going to work out like you planned. You will sometimes get held between stations for an indeterminate amount of time. Some days, the next train pulls up, and it is so packed with people that you have to wait 15 minutes for the next one to roll around. It will make you late some of the time, and it will almost always do this when it is really important for you to not be late. Sometimes you don't know when you're going to be moving again. Sometimes you even have to reroute and skip stops, and all of a sudden, you're nowhere near where you thought you were going to be. Now, I've by no means mastered all of the subway routes in New York City. I'm not ashamed to say that I still use Apple Maps on a daily basis to get where I'm trying to go. And even that fails me sometimes. But I figured out a way to operate and get myself around, to try to plan ahead for the delays that you can't control. And it's how I've gotten around almost every day living in New York City for the last six years. All right, so six years, I'm sure you've probably figured out by now that's not entirely true, and I'm skipping over something sort of minor. In March of 2020, you may be familiar, in what I thought would be my junior year, a global pandemic hit. School moved online for the rest of the semester, and I came back home to Indianapolis. I traded subways for pretty much nothing, if we're being honest. Broadway was shut down, like all theaters, and I was studying performance, but now that was somehow dangerous. It was a crazy time, as we all know, with so much uncertainty. But I kept doing classes online at home, and I needed something to fill the time and keep me from going crazy. Then one day I got a call from a theater group here in Indy that I'd spent a lot of summers with in high school called Summerstock Stage. They were going to have to cancel all of their shows that summer, so they were planning on creating a series of virtual music videos to keep the kids involved from home and they asked me if I would edit these videos. My choir teacher from North Central, Mike Ronick, also a Sycamore parent, came on to direct the music, and they brought on a choreographer. We came up with a plan to teach music and choreography over Zoom, and then have the students record themselves in their own houses later that week. I would line all of the videos up together and edit them together in about 48 hours. And at the beginning, I even wrote my brother Isaac into editing the music with us too. We did six weeks of these videos, pushing out one video every week. And it was a great challenge for myself to get back into editing videos, to have to edit that quickly, and to stay connected in those early days of the pandemic. But as the six weeks, uh, as the six weeks of these videos were ending, it was becoming clear to all of us that the pandemic would be going on for a lot longer than we initially thought. Mike and I were talking, and he mentioned how he was trying to figure out what he was going to do for a choir at his own school if they were really going to be online for another year. He said that there might be a real need for videos like this, since we had no idea when people were going to be able to sing in schools or on stages again. If a choir or a theater group wanted to perform and sing safely, it had to be virtual now. We could only find a few companies creating these kinds of videos online, and now, through trial and error, we had a process down from six weeks of experience. We developed an initial business model and a pricing plan, and pretty quickly we realized 
we were starting a business together. We made a website, created an LLC, and we started Riverbend Production Co. So we thought when we first started that it might be cool if we managed to find a few clients, have something to keep us busy, and maybe make a little extra money while we were sitting in our houses staring at our laptops. The first two months started slowly. Mainly we had local churches and synagogues reaching out to us looking for a way to keep music involved in their services. A few local school choirs, but word of mouth spread and it quickly became much bigger than we ever expected. Something that we started just to stay connected and fill the time turned out to be an actual need that people and organizations had. And we had quickly created the infrastructure without really knowing it to make that happen. At first, the company was just Mike and me. I was the video editor and the company manager, but after the first six months, the demand ended up being more than we could handle. So instead of starting to turn people away, we decided to hire a business manager to help with our bookkeeping, and we hired six independent editors from across the country that we have still to this day never met in person to help <laughs> take on more projects. We ended up being hired by the IRT, the Booth Tarkington Civic Theater, the Atlanta Opera, the Washington Children's Chorus, and the Drug Enforcement Agency in the Department of Justice. Do you know what it's like to get an email from the Drug Enforcement Agency? <laughs> because I do. So as all this was happening, I opted to go part-time at NYU and delay my graduation by a year so I could take virtual classes part of the day and work on the company for the rest of it. In our first year of operation, we ended up grossing over $200,000 and making over 200 videos for groups in the United States and Canada. Now, after saying that, I want to keep things balanced. So this section of the presentation, sort of similar to our last presentation, is called Things I Didn't Know I Didn't Know. We're going to talk about the subway, and we're also going to talk about running a business. And to mix, mix things up, I'm just going to go one from each category. The subway. Just because a train says what the next stop is going to be does not mean that you're going to arrive at that stop. And in the category of business, we have bookkeeping. <laughs> the temperature on subway platforms does not correspond with the temperature outside, so plan accordingly. Taxes. <laughs> How do you do them? What is a write-off? What is a W-9 and what is a W-4 and why do those things scare me? <laughs> if you drop something off of a subway platform, it legally belongs to the rats now. You have no claim. <laughs> Employees versus independent contractors. What are they? How do I pay them? So this, voice is, this list is honestly really a lot longer. But as the business grew, I found myself faced with these things pretty much every day, faced with things on a daily basis that I didn't know, things that I had to figure out by researching and learning on the job or just pretending I knew what I was doing. I was lucky to have a tremendous amount of support from Mike, my business partner, my dad with business and accounting advice, my aunt with legal advice, anyone that would listen and could offer me help. But even with that support, I suddenly found myself on a track I hadn't expected, in a place I hadn't expected, and moving at a speed that nothing could have prepared me for. I did manage to learn a little about those things along the way and not run the company into disaster or get pursued by the IRS, which is a win in my book. But I also have to zoom out a bit here because I never thought that I would be starting my own company one day, let alone doing it with one of my ex-high school teachers during a global pandemic. From as early as I can remember, I thought the route for my life was clear. Step one, move to New York, check. Step two, perform in Broadway shows, not so check. Step three, be successful forever. And step four, that was pretty much it. Even as I was learning more and getting curious about different things, I never really gave this plan a second thought. I thought to be successful meant to make a plan for yourself and follow through on it. But what happens when all of a sudden the train you're on just stops? What happens when a pandemic comes along and reroutes the train altogether? Starting a business and running a virtual production company was never my backup plan waiting in the wings. I couldn't have planned for it. And honestly, I was so overwhelmed with it while it was happening that I didn't know most of it was happening. But it did teach me over time that it's not about choosing the route you feel like you're supposed to take or you've already chosen. It's about weathering the challenges, adapting, and accepting where the route takes you. 
getting to the right place at the end of the track, even if it's not where you expected you'd be. I've come to understand that you can find different ways that your passions and your talents can fit with a need in the world. Opportunities might come looking for you in really random places. You just have to keep your eyes open and approach it with passion, hard work, and authenticity. And then you can do anything, even things you know nothing about. Because even when you've exhausted all of your options alone, people will recognize that passion and hard work and want to join you. And then you can join forces and collaborate to create even more. So at the end of summer 2021, classes at NYU were finally going to be back in person again, so I moved back to New York City. The demand for these virtual videos was dying down as things started shifting back, and while I was grateful for all the experiences we had had, I knew that I wanted to get back to New York. I wanted to focus on my second senior year, and Mike was going to be teaching again in person, so we decided to stop creating the virtual performance videos altogether. After graduation, I stumbled on a job listing on Facebook for a videography position with Broadway World, and I realized that that might be the perfect next stop. I got to shift my focus to filming things and seeing things in person all over the city, which, with much less time sitting alone behind my computer screen. I get to be a part of the industry I've always wanted to be in and make videos about it, the same kinds of videos that I watched for years before I moved to New York. And I also have flexibility and time to keep exploring all the things I'm passionate about to see where they might take me next. For, um, that's really for the kids, too. <laughs> Basically, I said this earlier, for all of us that are sitting here now, for those of us who are alumni, for the current Sycamore students, we all have this stop in common. And because of what we gain here, it becomes a station that can connect you to any line and any stop, wherever you want to go and I've already seen it in my graduating class just in the last 10 years. Now I'm gonna finish with some of my eighth grade graduation speech because honestly I got tired of writing and Sycamore taught me to work smarter, not harder. <laughs> but this is real. This is something that I actually said at eighth grade graduation and it's still something I believe. Okay, maybe. Oh, hey Sarah. <laughs> so this is what I wrote. For some of us, this is the only school we have ever known. For those of us for which this statement is true, it has made it considerably harder to understand how different and uncommon an institution like this school truly is. Can you tell I was trying to use big words? From the moment I walked in the doors of my EC2 classroom, I learned that I could be whatever I wanted to be. If I wanted to be an astronaut, if I wanted to be Peter Pan, the teachers and my classmates told me and showed me that not only was it okay, but that they would help me fly. I believe some of the most important words for a child to hear in our world today is that we can be anything we want to be, that we can do anything we want to do. Sycamore has taught me that the beginning of knowledge is the discovery of something we do not understand. And it didn't just teach us the answers to our questions, but it taught us how to figure the answers out for ourselves. So true, eighth grade me. We all have been gifted such an incredible opportunity to be here to be with each other and have intersected at this stop. There's no telling what stop we'll get to next or where we'll go after that. But that's what I've come to appreciate is the best part. For me, all I know right now is my next stop is back to Manhattan, a flight to Newark, and then the train back to my apartment. And if I get stuck on that train along the way, no, nah, I'm still gonna be pissed. <laughs> Thank you everyone, have a great night.